And uh, number three is uh, the appeal of 626 Kenneth Street variance decision. Before we go on to that, uh, Becky, I want to make a disclosure. This was heard um, in November, when I, November 21st, when I was uh, on the Board of Adjustments. I was the chair of that, and uh, I find it that I'll, if I'm in a position where I have to make a decision, I, it will not be any kind of a bias, bias, or I'll, uh, any kind of a bias on it one way or the other. I'll listen to whatever comes up tonight. We will not be taking new testimony on this. This is strictly testimony from that hearing that we have, and that's what will be discussed amongst the council and the council's findings. So with that, uh, Becky, I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> okay. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councilman. Before you tonight is an appeal of a variance decision for a parcel at 626 Kenneth Street. This uh, variance was denied by the Board of Adjustment on November 21st, 2013. And for everyone's understanding, I'd like to provide first a definition of a variance from the Idaho State Code. This is from six, Code Section 67-6516. A variance shall not be considered a right, but may be granted only upon a showing of undue hardship because of characteristics of the site and that the variance is not in conflict with the public interest. The property owner proposed to divide a parcel at 626 Kenneth Street into two parcels and requested a variance from the required minimum lot width for one of the resulting parcels. The subject property is located here outlined in red. It's between, it's on the north side of Kenneth Street between South Logan and Lynn Avenue. Here's just a closer look at the subject property. Before I get into the details of the application, I'd like to provide a couple code provisions and definitions that are relevant to the application. From Chapter 6 of the Zoning Code, every lot shall abut a public street right away for a minimum of 40 feet. However, within each zone, a minimum lot width is defined that is specific to the type of the dwelling. And lot width is defined as the dimension of the lot line at the street or in an irregular shaped lot, the dimension across the lot at the building line, or in a corner lot, the narrow dimension of the lot at a street or building line. So for example, in the R3 zone, the minimum lot width requirement is 60 feet for single family and two family dwellings. And in the R1 zone, it's 80 feet. Um, the example here on the right is a parcel within the R1 zone, and I wanted to provide an example of an irregular shaped lot. These are typically found um, adjacent to cul-de-sacs. As you can see here, the, the parcel abuts the cul-de-sac at a width of 53 feet, so it meets that minimum 40 feet requirement that it needs to abut a public street. When the front yard setback is applied, it's 25 feet in the R1 zone. When that is applied, that establishes the building lot line where the lot width is then measured on this type of a lot. And here it is measured at 80 feet which is the minimum lot width for R1. Additionally, flag lots shall abut a public street right away for a minimum distance of 20 feet. The flagpole portion of the lot shall not exceed 150 feet in length and shall not be less than 20 feet in width at any point. There is no maximum width specified for that flagpole portion of the lot. A flag lot is defined as a lot with access provided to the part of the lot designated for use as a building site by a narrow corridor. So here I have an example of a flag lot, and as you can see, the parcel abuts the public street at a width of 20 feet, and it remains at 20 feet until it reaches the building site in the rear. And that narrow corridor is at a length of 94 feet, which is less than the um, maximum 150. So once again, the subject property that we're, that we're reviewing tonight is at 626 Kenneth Street. It's located within the medium density residential R3 zone. In the R3 zone, the minimum lot width for single family and two family dwellings is 60 feet or 50 feet for lots which are provided rear access from an alley. The subject property does not have alley access. This is a site plan that was submitted by the applicant 
the subject property is 110 feet in width currently. The darker gray shaded area would create a new lot that would be in full compliance with the zoning code and it would also include the existing home that is there now. The other lightly shaded area that to the north and the west of the gray uh, would be the second parcel that would be created and would have a minimum width of 50 feet along Kenneth Street, which is 10 feet less than the required minimum of 60 feet. Here's just a photo of the site from Kenneth Street. The red home there is the existing house. The subject property is a one half acre parcel, 110 feet in width. There are 25 lots on the Kenneth Street block. Three of them exceed 100 feet in width. Four, and one of those is the subject property. 14 of the lots are between 50 and 56 feet in width, which is less than the required minimum of 60 feet. And it's assumed that those were created prior to 1957 before the code was changed to require 60 feet. Land use in the area consists primarily of single family homes. However, there are two lots that have two family dwellings on them. This map denotes the land use in the area and all each of the 25 previously mentioned lots are shown here. The purple denotes single family dwellings and the blue is two family dwellings. Vehicle access to the subject property is off of Kenneth Street. Kenneth Street is a 30-foot wide paved residential street with curb, gutter, and sidewalk along most of the street. There is a gap of sidewalk missing in front of the subject property and the parcel to the west. Relating this application to the comprehensive plan, Chapter 2, Community Character and Land Use, designates the subject property as neighborhood conservation. Neighborhood conservation areas are intended to preserve the character of existing residential neighborhoods. An objective of Chapter 2 is to protect existing <coughs> neighborhood identity and character by preventing unintended impacts to established neighborhoods when new areas are developed or zoning designations are modified. Here's just a few more photos of other residences located on Kenneth Street to give you an idea of the street character. On the hearing in November before the Board of Adjustment, the staff supported the proposal for the following reasons. The proposal was consistent with the comprehensive plan in the idea that it preserved the neighborhood character. The creation of two parcels with a single family dwelling near and facing the street would be consistent with the nearby lots. The proposal would result in public street improvements including installation of a large portion of the sidewalk gap that is currently missing on the north side of Kenneth Street. However, the staff found it difficult for the application to achieve compliance with the relevant criteria and standards, specifically numbers one through four, that are required for the approval of a variance and no further recommendation was provided to the board. On the, on the night of the hearing, there was no public testimony in favor or in opposition of the variance other than the applicant's testimony. There was a significant amount of discussion among board members, staff, and the <coughs> applicant regarding the allowance of multiple structures on a single parcel within the R3 zone. Multiple structures are allowed on a single parcel as long as the minimum lot area per dwelling is met for the type of dwelling in question. So for example, a single family dwelling requires a minimum lot area of 6,000 square feet per dwelling. So if there's a 12,000 square foot lot, that lot would be permitted to have two single-family homes. And then likewise with a two-family dwelling, one two-family dwelling requires 7,000 square feet. So a 14,000 square foot lot would be permitted to have two two-family dwellings. I point this out, but it's important to note that this topic and discussion is not relevant to the variance request and the application that was before the board. Now I'd just like to go through the relevant criteria and standards that are used to base the decision of a approval or a denial of a variance. Special cons conditions or circumstances must exist which are peculiar to the property such as size, shape, topography, or location and which are not applicable to other properties similarly situated in the same zoning district. Because of the aforementioned special conditions and or circumstances of the property, 
application of the provisions of the zoning code would impose undue hardship and deprive the property owner of rights commonly enjoyed by owners of other properties similarly situated in the same zoning district. The special conditions or circumstances of the property are not the result of the actions of the applicant or the property owner. Granting of the variance will not confer a special privilege to the subject property that is denied other similarly situated property in the same zoning district. And finally, granting of the variance is not in conflict with the public, public interest or injurious to property or persons in the vicinity of the subject property. The Board of Adjustment, like I mentioned, has, has denied the decision based on the fact that they could not satisfy criteria numbers one through five. For number one, they found that no special conditions or circumstances existed about the lot. <clears throat> they concluded for number two that the zoning ordinance did not impose undue hardship or deprive the owner of rights enjoyed by others. For number three, the fact that there was no special conditions found, they concluded that number three did not apply. Number four, they concluded that granting the variance would confer a special privilege by allowing the owner to create a lot that is smaller than other undeveloped lots. And finally, for number five, they determined that since granting the variance would provide a special privilege to the owner, that it would be in conflict with the public interest. The complete appellant statement is included in the packet before you tonight. However, I will give a summary. The appellant contends that the variance request is consistent with neighborhood preservation goals of the comprehensive plan and that the issues and facts of the application were not considered by the board and the rationale for the decision was not based upon the comprehensive plan, relevant ordinances and statutes, constitutional principles or factual information. The appellant contends the term similarly situated is fluid, was not defined by the board and the conclusions related to this term were made by comparing the subject lot to an unknown lot. And the appellant contends the relevant criteria and standards for this application do not include explanation of the decision as required, nor were they drafted and approved as required by city code. The actions that may occur tonight, um, as stated in the zoning code, are as follows. When considering the merits of an appeal, no additional public testimony or information shall be taken or considered by the council. After considering the record and the reasons for the appeal, the council shall take one or more of the following actions. They may sustain the decision of the board in whole or in part. They may reverse the decision of the board in whole or in part. Or they may remand the decision. Remand the matter in whole or in part to the board of adjustment with comments and or instructions for further consideration by the board. The council shall remand an appeal in whole or in part for gathering of additional material information and a decision and an accompanying reason statement based upon the original and the additional presented evidence where the appellant shows the council by a preponderance of the evidence that there is one of two things. New material information which was not available or readily discoverable at the time of the final decision and that it is in the public interest to develop such additional material information on the matter. So with that, I am available for questions. Thank you, Becky. <coughs> Dan. <coughs> Becky, how come, uh, and, and you, I might have missed it while you were going through it, but right next door, uh, I would say probably two addresses west, or maybe it's east, west, I guess. Um, no, it would be two addresses east. That's a flag lot. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't the proposal create a flag lot? Um, the applicant desires to build a, a dwelling along the street frontage. So a flag lot is defined as having okay. that narrow corridor that leads to a building site. There wouldn't be allowed, development would not be allowed within that narrow corridor. So the, just the de definition of a flag lot is no development in the, I mean, if they said that they were only going to develop in the back half, you could have as wide a corridor coming forward as you want. Right, there's no width specified, so no maximum width specified, so. But they wanted, they are talking about fronting mm -hmm. closer, so. Okay, thank you. Tom, um, question? I, I had a couple of de uh, definition questions, including this one about a flag lot. I mean, if we just thought of that as a flag lot, it's 50 feet and a, and a flag is minimum of 20, 50 is bigger than 20, therefore it works. 
<laughs> but you're also saying that you're not allowed to build within that 20? That's right. Within a flag lot? So there's mm -hmm. a, another rule that says that. It's just that it comes from the definition of a flag lot. So do we have a, a clear definition of flag lot? This is exactly as, as stated in the code. It just says that um, it's a lot with access provided to the part of the lot designated for use as a building site. So the narrow corridor is not considered part of the building site. It leads to the building site. It's not considered, but is it not allowed? That's my understanding. I mean, at 50 feet, <laughs> if you had a flag lot that's 80 feet, would you allow it? And I mean, would we allow it in there? So I, I guess I'm trying Bill, to really understand the definitions of this. A, Bill hop in here as well. Yeah. <clears throat> in order to maintain the integrity of a lot width standard, you you really couldn't allow somebody to do a pseudo flagpole lot that was less than the minimum lot width and then allow them to build within that area. The intent of the code is flagpole lots are lots that have a narrow corridor that leads to the building site and the building site is outside of that narrow corridor. 